Come on. Hey, family. So good to see you. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, feel free to crack those open with me. Uh, we are doing, this is the last edition of our uncut version of Soul Care. Um, I called it uncut. It's not, it's not, yeah, that's me. This is the, this is extended version. Yes, extended version. Um, this is the last one we are going to do. And uh, I, what we've been doing is really unpacking how this, the soul is the hub of the life of an individual and how your soul is you are. I've been talking about what, what does it look like for the God of all creation to partner with us in the care of our soul. And so with this last message, um, I want to just title this Soul Rest. Soul Rest. His yoke, your rest. If you would stand with me. Um, we're going to read what the Anglican Church calls the comfortable words. This is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Many of you know it. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I have just one thought. When life is hard and your soul is heavy, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. When life is hard and your soul is heavy, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Amen. You may be seated. Um, many years ago, I was a, a youth pastor here, and um, I remember one day, I'll never forget it, um, it was right over here in this, in, in this room, I, I'll never forget it, I'm just not sure where it was, uh, uh, that was awkward. Uh, um, so I, I had an appointment with a person, and uh, I remember that I was... I was really thirsty, and I asked, hey, do you want a drink of, of would, would you like water? And, um, and they said yes. And so um, I, I don't know if you've ever been to the refrigerator and thought you were getting one thing, and you were actually getting something else. Um, well, I, I went to the refrigerator, and I grabbed a, a jug of, of water. And I, it was a, you know, it was a gallon, you know, just one of those, jugs where you undo the top and I, I popped the top and I poured a glass and it was a big glass and I was very thirsty and I, I downed it. Then I realized this isn't water. Uh, this isn't water at all. And then I, I felt a sensation in my body um, and what ended up happening is I drank cleaning fluid, um, and, uh, and I actually found myself in, in the hospital. Um, I mean, it's a nice little story. It was, look, it was just an accident, no responsibility within this church whatsoever. Uh, but I just remember going, man, what I thought I was getting, I'm not getting at all. The context of the story, nice transition, um, the, the, the context of Matthew chapter 11 is pretty, pr pretty important. Um, if, you, if you go to the beginning of this chapter, what you'll find is you'll find um, a man by the name of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, uh, he had a mission. His mission was to prepare the way for the Messiah, for the Lord. And he had done that really, really well. Um, he had preached the kingdom of God. And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, we find a very telling moment. Verse 2 and 3. Now, when John 
heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ. He sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? He thought he was getting one thing and he found something altogether different. Have you ever found life is hard? Life is hard. For, for John, I, I can't, I just, I can't imagine what he must have been thinking in prison. He had done everything right. He'd done it right. He had exhausted himself for the Messiah. He had completed his roles and responsibilities. He was trying to be faithful. And yet here he is in his faithfulness and he is in prison. I mean, he, he finds himself, he is ashamed, he's hungry, physically tormented, emotionally isolated, his expectations were, were, were unmet. I mean, he, he's in prison and all he's thinking is, I know what Isaiah chapter 61 says, that the Messiah comes to release the captives, to set the captives free. The Messiah is going to do his Messiah thing and he's going to get me out of where I'm at. Here he is, expectations, longings, desires, unmet, in prison, life is hard. Have you ever been there where you have been faithful? You've laid down your life for someone. You've exhausted yourself for the good of others and it has gotten you in prison. At least the feeling of being in prison, you feel locked up, you feel like, you're not seen, you feel like there is no way out. Life is hard. And, and I love the fact that what, what John does is he, he gives the permission to ask questions. He says, should I expect another? What you can call this, you can call this doubt. You can call it doubt. Life is hard. Doubt rises. And you might be saying, well, Corey, isn't doubt a terrible thing? I love what Alistair McGrath says about doubt. He's, a, he's an apologist, brilliant guy. This is what he says. Doubt is natural within faith. It comes because of our human weakness and frailty. Unbelief is the decision to live your life as if there is no God. It is a deliberate decision to reject Jesus and all that he stands for. But doubt is something quite different. Doubt arises within the context of faith. It is wistful longing to be sure of the things in which we trust. But it is not and need not be a problem. Can you just exhale with that? Like it is, it is so healthy to get into spaces where you doubt. John did. Why? Because life is hard. And, and your soul gets heavy. Imagine the pressure he must have felt and the, the confusion he must have been navigating and the exhaustion that he had. Do you feel that? Life is hard, but guess what? So is faith. Faith is hard too. If you back up a little bit, I, again, you got to see, when you read your, 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 your scriptures, you got to take a text that you love so much and get a bigger picture of what's going on in the greater scheme of that book because what's happening, if you back up even further, what you find in the book of Matthew is that Matthew is helping us see the reality of of life in trying to follow Jesus. Like he is giving us several examples of the fact that faith is hard. And I, I'm going to read a few of these texts because I want to prove this to you because for many of you, you believe that when you come to Jesus, like somehow there is, that is tied to 
some type of comfortable life. Now, you would never say that. I would never say that. But deep intrinsically, I think we kind of believe that. We have an assumption of that. We hope that. And let me just give you kind of a walkthrough of of what faith, what Matthew describes following Jesus in a life of faith. Life is hard, yes. Faith is hard, too. This is Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard. Hard? 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 That leads to life. And those who find it are few. Corey, how can his yoke be easy and his burden be light and the way be hard? Faith is hard. It's hard. Matthew 8, 22. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, that's fun. I mean, that's a perfect place for a wolf, for a sheep to be. Ah, da, 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 da. It's okay. I'm surrounded by things that want to eat me, and I'm fat, and I can't run. That's awesome. I'm sorry if I offended any sheeps in the room. I, but no, but this is what, again, this is what Jesus, he's saying, he's trying to help us understand when it comes to having a, per, a perception and a perspective of, of life and following Jesus, He's making it very clear that life is hard, so is faith. This is Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Faith is hard. Are you exhausted? Fine. Your your heart and your soul is heavy. Even like the systems that we turn to, specifically in the world, man, they're hard too. In the day of Jesus, the system that everybody really was guided by and what kind of your health and your reality was determined by was the religious system. This is what Matthew 23, 4 says. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. There was a system then that was a religious system which said, earn your life. Now, we don't live in necessarily a religious system, but we live in a secular system. And that system doesn't say earn your life. That system says create your life. Create your life. And that system is heavy and hard and exhausting. And we try to do it, and we're getting crushed in the process. Create your life. Live your truth. You do you. It is on you. You form your reality, and you live into it, and your responsibility is to create to create a truth and then to, to both exhaust yourself to live into that truth and identify what truth even is. And this is what Adam Grant of the New York Times, in an article that he wrote on languishing, and this is what he says. It wasn't burnout. You still had energy. It wasn't depression. We didn't feel hopeless. We just felt somewhat joyless and aimless. It turns out there's a name for that, languishing. Languishing is a sense of stagnation and emptiness. It feels as if you're muddling through your days, looking at your life through a foggy windshield, and it might be the dominant emotion of our day. Looking at life through a foggy windshield. Life's hard. Your soul is heavy. And see, this doesn't even include the realities of family life and disappointment, health and its complexities, 
relationships and the power they have over us, jobs and their demands, finances and their disappointments, emotions and their power, thoughts and their effects. It's almost like Matthew is funneling the whole book to this verse. Everything just gets dumped into, a, into the reality that all of us, that life is hard. And now we are acknowledging. I, I know that you're going, well, where's the happy news? This is depressing and I'm sad. Well, I think that's kind of the point. I think that's the point. It's for all of us to get to a place where we acknowledge, man, my heart is heavy. And I am living in a space where I have no control. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. This is the important news. And this is what I'm excited to share with you. He says, my yoke is easy. It's, you know this, it's imagery of, of oxen. It was a plowing terminology and it was very common for a large oxen to be paired with and connected to a small oxen. And the purpose was that small oxen was supposed to follow and learn and even get stronger in this yoke that they were to carry together. And Jesus is saying to you and I, if you're overwhelmed, if you're exhausted, if you have no choice, if you are outmatched, if you are doing everything you can and you got nothing left, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. But what I love about this idea of his yoke is that this isn't like a 50-50 share, right? This is not you come and we split it, I'll take this and you take this. It's not a sharing of the load. It is Jesus saying, I want you to join me and I want to carry the load. I know what you're carrying. I know how it's crushing you. I know how it's overwhelming you. And I'm asking, I am pleading. The idea of come to me is not a normal word in the Greek. It's, a, it's an imploring of a father who just sees his child hurt himself and comes down and says, come here. But the child has the choice. That's the whole point. It's Jesus saying, please, come here. Like, come here. The whole book is saying, you don't have what it takes in life, in faith, in the world we live in. Will you come to me? That's good. But what kind of strength is this Jesus in this yoke? No, you're like, yoke? Well, I don't, like, what are you talking about? Like, how does Jesus invite me into his yoke? Like, what kind of strength does he have? Well, this is how he describes himself. He says he's gentle and lowly. Hmm. Interesting that the God of creation would describe himself as gentle and lowly. This idea of gentle, I don't necessarily like the translation of gentle, but the word, the Greek word is praus, it's uh, where you get meek. And what would happen in first century Rome is that they would have this process of choosing war horses. And a war horse would go through a process that was extremely intense because they were preparing them for a battle that had a ton of noises and fire and heat and weapons, and it was chaos. And so the only way you get a war horse ready is you get them through a process. And this process was extensive. I mean, it, would, it, it required so much chaos, but it ended with, a, with this last step of heat where a candle would be slowly lifted to their belly. And a, a horse was ready for battle when they had all power, but that power was under control. And they didn't run. The heat was there, but they 
had power under control. Guess what a war horse was called when they completed the process? They were meeked. They were called praus horses, war horses, meeked horses. What Jesus is saying is he's saying he has all power and all authority and all control. And he has, he has, he has brought it under control for one purpose, and that is to serve you and invite you to share with him in this yoke he created for you. He is humble, gentle. I'm sorry, he's, he's gentle, but he's not just gentle, but he's also, he's humble. And when I think of humble, I instantly think of Philippians chapter two, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human, in, in, in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This powerful one now empties himself for the specific purpose of being obedient to the Father. And how is he being obedient to, to, to the Father? By choosing the life of the servant and creating now a space for you to come and do life with him, not just once, not just with a prayer, but a lifestyle of you waking up and asking God, will you give me the desire to desire you? Will you give me a longing to join you in this yoke that you've created for me? But keep, please keep in mind, this Jesus, this one who's inviting you into his yoke, he is all-powerful, all-knowing, unchanging, self-existent, sovereign, ever-present, infinite, eternal. And he is inviting you with him. He has all power. He reigns over all things. And I'm, I read those, that list, and you may be going, I don't, didn't catch any of that. Just That's called the doctrine of God. That is God being above all, and yet humbling himself and taking on a form in order to win you and to win me. Not just for us to get to heaven, but for us to bring heaven to earth as we begin to look like Jesus in the yoke. In, in, in the oak. But what I love here is that this idea of, of soul rest and Jesus saying, come and join me. He doesn't just walk alongside of us in this yoke. Guess what he does? He literally puts himself in you. This is what Colossians 1 says. 27, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Again, not just Jesus walking alongside of you, his commitment is so exhaustive that he, is, he, he created you and I in order for him to now live inside of you and then him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil. He's struggling with all whose energy? His energy. That he powerfully works in me. When you get in the yoke, all of God's power now comes in you for you to toil and work and strain, but you're not straining with your energy, you're straining with his. That now you have the courage to fight sin. You have the courage to now, to, to, to exhaust your heart in holiness. You have the longings to reorient your heart around what God has called you to and invited you to. And you take your money and you go, God, I, here's my, my money. I, I'm toiling in generosity with your energy, not with my own. I mean, do you realize when you do that, you're not earning God's favor? You have it, and with it, you're now toiling and straining, and you're in the yoke, pushing, and you're pulling with him, and his power is working in you to move forward. This is, this is what it looks like 
When life is hard, your soul is heavy, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I love, he says, in the midst of all of this, he says, now, learn from me. Hmm, what is it? Learn. Like, why would he say that? Take on, put my yoke on you. Take, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I thought, like, what does that even look like? I recently heard of a, an ophthalmologist a couple years back. She had a patient that came to her and said, man, I can't see. I'm, things are blurry. I'm having a tough time just identifying things around me. And will you look at my eyes? And she, she opened up her eyes and had a Q-tip and she just kind of brushed her eyes real gently. All of a sudden, the contact lens came popping out. I was like, that's interesting. And she does it again. Another one. She does it again. Another one. She does it again. Another one. She does it again. 23 contact lenses stuck in this lady's eyes. And what she, what she did is that every time she, her eyes got blurry, she put another set of contact lenses in. She couldn't see more contact lenses. Couldn't see more contact lenses. Do, like, do you realize in the world that we live in, man, we are constantly looking for vision. We're like searching for it. And so we put in the contact lenses of, man, I, money and sex and politics and man, I'm just, I am gonna do everything I can to numb what I feel. And we contact lens the mess out of our life. We just contact, contacts, contacts. And Jesus says, Come to my yoke. And guess what? Learning from him is just saying, God, I am gonna sit still and I'm gonna allow you to begin to slowly take contact lenses. How we see the world. How we see the world. And it's seeing it, and all of a sudden he begins to work on us. And we give him our hands for him to use our hands for, for purposes where we, it's not just about indulging, 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 but say, no, no, God, I give you, I, I'm, will you work on the contact lenses of my own desires? You work on the contact lenses of my vision and, and my dreams, God, I, and he does it. He, he's like, you're learning from him. And he's just slowly scraping away the ways you've seen the world to give you a new view of the world. It's learning from him. And he says that his burden is light. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. When life is hard, your soul is heavy. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. In 1 John 5, verse 3, and this is going to be really important for you to grab this. This is what it says. Because you might be asking, how can Burden be light. How can getting in the yoke with Jesus not feel like a burden? Now, when you think about burdens, burdens are burdens because, one, you're unable to carry it. Like you, if I were to say, hey, I'm going to give you 100 pounds and you lift it up over your head for an hour, like that's, that would be a burden because you couldn't. Well, some of you could, but like most of you couldn't. Do that. So it's a burden because you can't do it, or it's a burden when you don't want to do it. That's a burden. Like when someone asks you to, I mean, kids, like students, if I were to ask you, have you ever felt burdened when your parents ask you to do something at home? Most of the students would say, absolutely, I feel burdened all the time. Because you just don't, it's a burden when you don't, don't want to do it. It's you can't or you won't. And what we've been looking at is the fact that J J Jesus actually says, no, no, I'm with you, therefore you can. You can. But 1 John 5, 3 is that this now becomes the hope that our motivations change too. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. How does that work? This is how it works. God is love. That's what he says in the text. He loves you infinitely. 
And as a result, he becomes infinitely lovely. And so the yoke of Jesus is knit, it's wired. The, the mechanisms of God's yoke is his love, his love for you. And every time we step into it, we're stepping into it and he's committing to partnering with us to remind us that he loves us infinitely. And that infinite love now enables us to see him as infinitely lovely. And we all know we will do whatever it takes for those that we love. God loves you infinitely. This yoke is a yoke of love. And it is an invitation to look at him and to say, I am seeing you as infinitely lovely. So let me close with this. Case study of how this actually worked in the scriptures. Many of you, you know, you've read the, the gospel of John and um, he is like the love guru. I mean, he is every t- he's just love, he loves everything. First John, second John, third John, every- he is, he's a man defined by the love of God. But what's interesting about the, the gospel of John and the story of John is I think the most fascinating text in all of John's gospel is in John chapter 13, verse 23. It says he's lying back on Jesus' chest was one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, before this point, we don't know a lot about John, but the one thing that we do know about him is that he has a brother named James, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they have a nickname, the sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder, he got that pretty naturally. It, like, it, was a, it was an earned name. The reason that he got it is that he went to a Samaritan village with Jesus, and he looks at the Samaritan village, and he asks, he and his brother, ask, ask Jesus, can we borrow your power to destroy this village? Can we kill people with your power? The Sons of Thunder. All we know about John is that he, he was, there were things in him that were at unrest. But then he comes to a moment where he comes to Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And it was in the Passover, it was the Last Supper, it was in the middle of chaos. And what he does is he lays his head on the chest of Jesus. And somewhere in this process, in joining Jesus in his yoke, a transformation occurs from the sons of thunder to now an apostle of love. One man in the yoke with Jesus. And that yoke, it began to go to work in his heart. And I, I wonder, is, is tonight a night where you just, I've been trying to build a case. I've been trying to build a case that life is hard. And you have to acknowledge that. You have to acknowledge the impact that life has had on you. That faith, your faith, has had in your journey. And for you to acknowledge, I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I got nothing left. I feel like I've been faithful and I'm in prison. Tonight could be the beginning of a life that you live where you live in the yoke. Where you, where you live in this place of, of asking for your eyes to be open to the loveliness of God and his love for you so that you can now respond to his commandments not with resistance, but with love. Tonight might be a night where, where you, what you need more than anything at, at all is just to, like John, to fall into the chest. To, to now, 
be embraced by a loving father who's real and wants to come close. Here's, here's my vision for us. Here's my, here's my vision. In Israel, and I've showed this before, but I'm going to show it again. One of my favorite, I'm going to go see it one day, but one of my favorite places in the world is the Gan Hashlosha National Park in Israel. It is literally in a desert. It's called the Three Springs Park. The reason it's called the Three Springs Park is because there are springs underneath the ground that meet in this location, and it results in, a, in, in an outpouring of beauty and safety and flourishing. Flourishing. And I believe this is what it looks like for a soul who is in the yoke to live. You, you're made to flourish. You know you are. You, you're longing to. You're longing to step into a lifestyle, into a rhythm where you, you, do, you look at life differently, but that you now, in, you like, Take a step forward in desperation of saying, God, I am desperate for you to do something in me because if you don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm desperate to flourish. And this is what your soul is designed to look like. In the midst of desert, life, life rooted in the springs of Jesus, his beautiful, powerful Sovereign hand providing for you, strengthening you, even in the midst of chaos. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We love you. We're tired. We're tired. Some of us just don't even have the words is tired mind is tired Lord we as a people we take you up on your invitation and we say yes to come to you you forgive us for how we've come to everything else and the more we've come to those things the drier we've gone the more angry we've become, the more closed off our vision has become. But we come to you, the one who humbled himself and died, pierced hands, marks of your surrender to your father in order to now bring us into the yoke. Help us to treasure the yoke. Help us to prioritize your yoke. Give us the strength to keep coming back when we want to run away. Will your yoke form our appetites? Will it, will it reform and, and, and relearn the way we see ourselves, the way we handle our emotions, the way we navigate our own soul, the way we deal with relationships and operate with our money? Oh God, will your beautiful yoke Shape us as a church now. We need it. We need it and we say yes to it.